I just saw her. Okay, well, I'm not going to wait anymore. Uh, the role of the um, helper is to provide the transposes, and the role of the donor is to provide the insert flanked by oh. the recognition sites. Okay. I think people just kind of like randomly wrote like recognition sites, um, but nobody put like provide the transposes, which is the role of the helper. And you said donor is its role? The don't the donor is the thing that's donating the gene. So that's how you remember it. The donor is the thing that has the insert with the recognition sites. The helper is the thing that actually provides the mechanism to help it get in. So neither of the plasmas go directly into the organ. Oh, that's, you mean the complete plasma, no. Okay. The transposase cuts out that piece and then inserts it. Does that make sense? Okay. I guess we're still one one minute one minute before start. Who's the star? Star. Oh, I asked, I marked it wrong, and then I was like, "Wait, this is actually correct." So I converted the mark to a star. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Somebody, you drew it like upside down or something. So yeah. like when I was checking it, I was like, "Wait, what?" And then I was like, "Oh, okay, okay." Yeah. Whatever, let's begin. So, okay, we got PowerPoint to record, not as a crutch. Uh, I love Bacillus thuringiensis. This is an awesome topic. So uh, I'm happy today to be talking about this. Let's shut the lights off. Get the, get the mood going. Right before spring break. Uh, okay, so let's talk about the history of BT. So when I say BT, that means Bacillus thuringiensis. Today, my goal is to try to teach you everything that that means, sort of. Um, there were two theoretically independent discoveries of <laughs> Bacillus thuringien thuringiensis. Um, one was German, and the other was Japanese. So in Germany and in Japan, um, a guy named Ernst Berliner, and this is around 1910, Okay, discovered BT, and I haven't done enough reading into the Japanese discovery yet to discuss that. So I'm going to focus today on the on the German discovery of it, how it happened. Ernst Berliner. Berliner, yeah. You like that name? Uh, okay, so actually the name. Um, no, this is us. You made it just in time. We're talking about the history of the discovery of Bacillus thuringiensis. And I was just about to say that Thuringia is actually like an alternate name for Germany. So back in the day when the German discovered the bacterium, it was named then uh, Bacillus thuringiensis after Thuringia. Okay, so just a quick history of science in general. This is in around the 1910s. So this is around the time just after, actually, uh, maybe, I guess this is 40 years, 30 years after, uh, in 1877, there was a guy named Patrick Manson. Okay, and Patrick Manson was famous for, in medical entomology, discovering that a disease called filariasis was vectored by mosquitoes. So this was, and he won a Nobel Prize for this, this was um, one of the first sort of links with, this was essentially like the first time somebody proposed the idea that like insects could spread diseases and insects had little things living inside of them, okay? So this is this was sort of like uh, a big thing that happened just before, in before the 1900s, okay? And then following that up in 1895, um, there was a guy named Ronald Ross, okay? And Ronald Ross was famous for then sort of following up this filariasis discovery by discovering that malaria was transmitted by mosquitoes. So this was kind of like a big popular thing to do around this time was to go, after these big discoveries were made, people started just going around collecting bugs and like looking inside of bugs at the stuff that lives inside of bugs. And so a lot of these bacteria were discovered sort of 
under the premise that like let's look inside of bugs for bugs within bugs. So that was a popular theme back then. Okay. So I just wanted to say that this sort of prefaced the the time when Bacillus thuringiensis was discovered in the early 1900s. Okay, so I have read um, some of these earliest German articles. I'm I have I had to translate I have to translate them with like Google Translator, so it's really hard to um, to get to read them. But I've gotten through a couple. Okay, so I'm going to tell the story of sort of how this happened. So um, the Berliner guy. The Berliner guy, Ernst Berliner, was um, a, what do you call it, when, uh, like flour, you put it in the grain, what, what, uh, what's that called, grain processing, he was like a grain processing scientist, okay, and he was working in Germany and he got a shipment of flour and the flour was, had contaminating caterpillars in it and the caterpillars were sick. Okay, so he decided to use this sort of tainted shipment of flour to study these sick caterpillars. Okay, and he describes the original sickness as flaccid sickness, which is kind of funny. Um, caterpillars are normally like turgid and like pressurized tubes. So like if you were to touch a caterpillar, it would, it would be like seem pressurized. If they have this disease, okay, they essentially like they melt from the inside and so they essentially become like flaccid tubes and eventually they turn brown and black and then eventually they dry up and they become what in the german they write as crumbled black mummies okay so they become like dusty crumbled mummies and they basically like first melt and then they turn into powder so this was sort of he described sort of like this weird pathology of these caterpillars and he called it the flaccid sickness uh, an organism that they were working on was Ephestia cuniella. This is a flower moth. Okay, so this is like a this is like a common pest, the Mediterranean flower moth. And what they would do is they would he would take these caterpillars, and so if here's the caterpillar, got like some things, something like that. Okay, so if here's the caterpillar. Um, Caterpillars insect and insects have sort of like a blood system which is called what? What? Yeah, hemolymph. Okay. So if you were to like rip open this caterpillar, um, it's gonna have like it's essentially gonna be like a tube inside there, and it's also gonna be kind of like filled with like hemolymph. Okay, so they would rip open these caterpillars and in the hemolymph they would look in the microscope and they would see a little rod, little rod bacteria, okay, with the microscope. And one of the other interesting things that they'd see is if they took the caterpillar, okay, and they ripped out, and they ripped out its guts, and they looked in the guts, they could actually see like crystals. In the German, it's described as like uh, light refracting something, something, something. And it's like, okay, that means crystals. Um, and they could actually see these crystals in the guts, okay? And later now we know that that is actually the crystallized form of these toxic proteins called cryproteins, which we will talk about. But it's just fascinating that when they first did this, you, they could actually see like the stockpiles of these toxins that Bacillus thuringiensis is so famous for producing. Okay. So let's talk about some terms. Um, caterpillars get this disease. How do you think they get it? The flaccid sickness. By consuming anything with Bt. Yeah, so they get it, that's perfect. They get it by consuming um, the Bt pathogen. And it's usually, they consume it in spore form. So what are spores? Small seeds. See, okay, well, that's if you're thinking about like plants, I guess, or like fungi. What are bacterial spores? They basically dried out bacteria with only the necessary genes. Yeah, they're kind of like, um, I guess you would describe them as like a hardened, hardened life form, life stage, maybe you could say. So if the, bac the bacteria will like secrete like proteins, 
that make its shell essentially like thicker. So it'll it'll like secrete proteins that essentially make like a shell around it. Okay, and it will essentially like stop all essential functions. So it will stop replicating its DNA. It'll stop transcribing genes, and it will go into essentially what is like a spore form. So it'll just like stop not living like it's still alive, but it will stop like metabolizing things and just kind of like go into like a dormant stage. So it goes into like a dormant stage. Why would it do this? Yeah, exactly. When conditions are unfavorable, the bacteria has two it has essentially two options. It can either die or it can go into spore form. And the hope with the spore form is that it will eventually come into a new context, a new environment where it can reactivate and start replicating again. So some bacteria have this biology where they go into spore form and Bacillus thuringiensis Bt is one of these. Okay, so if the bacteria Somebody's trying to like call. Interesting. Okay, so the bacteria has this like spore form that it will go into to go into like survival mode. And it hopes that a caterpillar will eat it in the spore form. And the caterpillar then presents this sort of new rich nutrient source that it can sort of feed on and melt as it replicates. Okay. So has everybody in this room heard of BT? Yes. Okay. So why is it so popular? Why did it catch on? Because it was a cost-effective organic means of eliminating caterpillars and things yeah. like that in your gardens. Yes. That's like exactly why. So some of the convenient things about this is it kills insects, and we'll talk about the mechanism of that in a little bit, and it's culturable. So it's not common with these, well, I guess when I say not common, I have to be careful how I say that. In some bacteria that you find in these weird environments, like living in an insect, sometimes it's difficult to culture them. But Bt is very, very good at being cultured. You can just, in the German, they say glycerin agar. Okay, so they just make agar plates and you can grow this on agar plates and you can mass produce the spores. So the idea was that they knew right away early in the 1900s was if we can mass produce these spores that kill insects, we can use this as a biological control. So it was immediately popular, but it didn't work right away on the flower moth because when they, what, they, what this guy tried to do originally, the Berliner, he tried to use it as a control mechanism. So he grew a bunch of these spores and he would like spray the spores, but these moths, they were living inside of, they produce silk and they protect themselves by like producing like a layer of silk. And so when they would try to spray the BT, the silk, it would just kind of stick to the silk and then the caterpillars or whatever would crawl out and they wouldn't really eat the BT. So originally with his studies, it didn't work very well because it didn't work in this particular application because of sort of a mechanical exclusion. The spores weren't, weren't getting to the spot where they needed to get to be consumed. Okay, so it didn't work originally right away, but they knew it was promising um, initially. Okay, so let's let's talk about BT more. Uh, it's gram positive. What does that mean? Yes, so it has a thick peptidyl glycan cell wall is gram positive. And what's the other thing about gram positive? So it has thick cell wall. What's the other property? No, one membrane. <clears throat> um, so gram negative bacteria have two membranes. Gram positive bacteria like BT just have an inner an inner membrane, and then a cell wall, inner membrane, and this is the thick cell wall. So that's what gram positive means. Where does it live? Do you guys know? Where is its like natural habitat? What? 
not always. It's not obligate. It's not. It doesn't. It doesn't have to live inside of the insects. This is a soil dwelling bacteria. So it lives inside the soils. Um, so let's ask a question. How and why would a soil dwelling bacteria evolve to kill insects and why would it want to do that? So sort of if, if Bt is like, if what it's famous for to us is that it kills insects, why would that evolve? Because the insects kill the plants that they get nutrients from. Yes, so that's what I think. Okay, so I, this is a, this is my hypothesis. Um, there is so if you're a plant, okay, if you're a plant, plants have like roots underground, okay, and this is famous sort of biology that around these roots, so around the roots. Plants are famous for secreting certain chemicals, okay, and these chemicals actually select for bacteria that they like, okay. So the roots are kind of like little farmers that farm and select for bacteria that they want around them. And some of these bacteria that they select for help the plant, okay. And this sort of, this interaction and this sphere this, this zone that they live in is called the rhizosphere, okay? And bacteria that live in the rhizosphere are called rhizobacteria, obviously. So very, very common rhizobacteria are things like bacillus subtilis, bacillus sphericus, and I'm hypothesizing these are close relatives of Bacillus thuringiensis. Okay, so I think that Bacillus thuringiensis probably was an was ancestrally related to these rhizobacteria, and it probably evolved these proteins because it was able to colonize these plants, and then if that plant is getting eaten by an insect herbivore. So if there's a bug on the plant that's eating it, the plants don't always have a way to defend themselves against herbivores, but if it could take this rhizobacteria and the rhizobacteria could kill its predator, then there could be sort of like a symbiotic relationship that could select for the evolution of these insect killing toxins. Okay, so I think that's how it happened. I think Bacillus thuringiensis is able to pick up these toxins because the plants, the plants like that, and then the plants would select for that bacteria to be around and would help that bacteria be around because, so it, it could provide environments that that bacteria likes and then in turn that bacteria would provide sort of a protective mechanism um, against plant herbivores. I think that's probably how it evolved. Okay. What does it also get out of, since we're talking about the evolution, why why would the Bacillus thuringiensis also, like what would it get out of being inside of an insect? Uh, spread farther. Yeah, so actually in the German, if you read the old German, um, in when they're describing the flaccid sickness, they talk about the caterpillars and they say they kind of like crawl around aimlessly like they're confused and then they like crawl up like they're about to pupate and then they don't pupate, they just die. And once they die and they become the powdered mummies, okay, then essentially like if wind or something were to like disrupt that or blow that, now what's gonna what's it gonna be spreading? The spores. The spores. So it's like a way, it's a dispersal mechanism for the bacillus. So the bacillus wants to invade the caterpillar because it get, that's its, that's its like food source. It can eat it and melt it, and then once it dries up. The caterpillar actually can walk around for a while while it's sick, so there's going to be a dispersal mechanism, and then the caterpillar is going to dry out and spread the spores. So the bacillus gets a lot out of this this sort of unique biology. Um, to relate this to the last class period, where we were talking about bacterial growth stages, remember how I drew this curve and I said bacterial growth kind of looks like this? 
Is that familiar? Mm -hmm. And I said that this is lag phase of bacterial growth. This is exponential phase. And this was stationary phase. Which phase do you think the spores would form in? Where's the cell signaling to begin spore formation going to be at? Yeah, so once, once sort of the cell growth hits the stationary phase, the bacteria is going to know to start forming spores. So that's just to relate it to that last class when we talked about recombinant expression and we talked about how when you induce protein expression, usually you're expressing it right here in exponential phase. Just a connection to the last class. Okay, so let's talk about how it kills, how it kills the insect. So there are proteins called cryproteins. That's their name, and you will want to remember that. What do you think the cry stands for? What? Cold? Cold? Cry? C-R-Y? Oh, cry. Oh, cry. You're thinking like cryogenic. No, not cold. Crystals? Yes, crystals. Um, and this comes from, remember long ago in the German articles, when they pulled out and dissected out the guts, they could see the crystals. They could see crystals form in the gut, and they didn't know what that was back then. But now we know that those are actually crystals forming of the cry proteins. So did you know that just like water can form crystals of ice, and um, what else forms? Salt can form crystals. Proteins can also form crystals. Did you guys know that? Okay, so proteins can form crystals. And a protein, in the same way that, like, if you were to draw, like, um, an ice crystal, oh, I'm, I'm probably going to draw it wrong, but, like, an ice crystal is made up of, like, a lattice of water molecules, right? A protein crystal is literally made up of a lattice of proteins, okay, that are all sort of homogenous. So a cry protein, cry proteins are famous that they express in high quantities. So the ribosomes are, make, will make lots of these cry proteins. And then those cry proteins will have special interactions that form these lattice structures that when this multiplies, it form, literally forms like crystals, okay? So those crystals that you see are actually like literally um, what you'd kind of call like, how do I want to phrase it? A bunch of protein-protein interactions that form these crystals. Okay, so are crystals soluble or insoluble? Are they? The very act of forming a crystal is sort of like the definition of insoluble. It's kind of like it falls out of solution and precipitates in such a way that it forms this lattice. So it's opposite of what you said. Crystals fall out of solution, so they're insoluble. I mean, that's going to depend on the buffer conditions, of course, but these crystals are produced inside of the Back, they're produced inside of the bacteria or secreted outside of the bacteria and the conditions under which they're made they're insoluble okay so if you have this insoluble block of cry proteins and it somehow gets inside of an insect gut so let's say it's eaten now and we are inside of an insect gut how does an insoluble mass of proteins kill the insect? Does it work? What? Does it just clog it up physically? That's an interesting hypothesis, but no, that's not what happens. Any other thoughts? Does it disrupt other protein processes? Well, so we are talking about solubility. Um, the cry proteins are not always insoluble. How are conditions going to change when the proteins get into an insect gut? What are guts famous for? Being full of bacteria? 
Well, our human gut is kind of famous for being full, full of bacteria, but insect guts do have some bacteria. Are they but famous? That, you're on the right track there. So guts are famous for changes in pH. So if this thing was in the soil or on the leaf, it's not. It's going to be in sort of like a natural pH environment. As soon as it gets consumed and gets put into the insect gut, guts are famous for being either super basic or super acidic. Um, and in acidic insect guts, what immediately starts to happen is these cry proteins start to fall out of solution. So these proteins will now start to be released from the crystal because of the change in the pH, okay? So now you're releasing these toxins. And if I was to draw out one of these toxins, okay, so here's a protein. You know how we always talk about, um, if I draw the ORF, here's the promoter, the five prime end, the three prime end. If this is the ORF that codes for a cry gene, okay, and this is its corresponding protein, We've talked a lot about five prime and three prime end, but we haven't talked a lot about orientation of proteins on the left side of the protein, which corresponds to the five prime end of the DNA. That is called the N terminus. And the other end, which corresponds to the three prime end of the gene in the protein is called the C terminus. Terminus. So if you haven't had that lingo, now you have, okay? So the N terminus is like the left side, the C terminus is like the right side of a protein, okay? And on the C terminus of proteins, of cry proteins, there's the cry domain. So domains are like, remember how I've talked a little bit before about proteins are like machines and they have these little domains, little parts of them that do certain things, okay? In the C terminus of cry proteins, they have a special domain whose function is to form the crystals. So if you cut the cry domain off, the crystals don't form. Okay. So I say this because in the insect gut, what are guts also famous for besides having changes in pH? What's the purpose of changing the pH? Yeah, digestion. That's the function of guts is to digest stuff. And most of what it's eating is like proteins. So the function of the gut is to digest proteins. Changes in pH are a big part of that, but what else is also a big part of that? You've got a lot of animal, what? Peristalsis, Peristalsis is yeah, like, like movement of things through the gut. Guts are also famous for having proteases. Why would they have proteases? Yeah, so proteases are going to break up proteins into amino acids, um, and then they, we can eat those amino acids, or insects can eat those amino acids. So a very, very famous gut protease is called trypsin. And trypsin is a protease that cuts proteins at positively charged amino acids, which are lysine and arginine. So when trypsin sees proteins that have lysines and arginines, it cuts them, okay? And the cry proteins have lysines and arginines that flank the cry domain so that when it gets into the gut, not only will the pH release the cry protein from the crystal structure, but whenever a trypsin molecule finds it, or protein finds it, it'll cut off the cry domain. So now this domain is completely like released into the gut. So the end terminus of the cry protein has been released into the gut, okay? And in the end terminus are two domains, usually. One of these domains is a pore forming domain. And one of these other domains is, I'll color code these, one of these other domains is a gut receptor binding domain. Now, knowing that there's these two domains exist on the end terminus of the cry protein, what do you think now happens once this thing is released?
What's this thing going to do? The gut receptor binding going to cause the crystals to bind together? Well, the, it's, it's now it's out of the crystal stage. So the first part of your logic was right. It's going to somehow have an interaction with the gut receptor. The second part of your logic was wrong in a sense that it's now been released from the part of the protein that causes the crystal formation. It's gone. That's been cut off. So now what happens is insect guts and all guts have what's called the epithelial layer. Okay, so if you think this is the what's called the, you could call this the basal lamina. This is like a wall that in the gut, if this is the gut lumen, this is the inside of the organism. This is like a general diagram of all guts. There's a wall and then there's a layer of cells called the epithelia. Okay, so if there's a layer of gut cells, each of these cells in its membrane is going to have little receptors. Okay, so I'll draw these with different colors. Little receptors. Proteins. Receptors are proteins that are in the membrane. Usually the function of these receptors is going to be, there's going to be many different kinds. Some of these things are going to be important for binding nutrients and then absorbing them into the cell because the role of the epithelia is going to be to take nutrients from the gut lumen and bring it into the cell and bring it, translate it into the organ, into the inside of the organism so that those nutrients can get dispersed. Okay, so this gut receptor binding domain is going to interact with these cells and this end terminus is now going to be inserting itself into the membrane so let's say I'll diagram let's get a let's get a good color let's say light blue okay so let me thicken this up light blue is going to be the end terminus of the cry protein it's going to start now inserting into the membranes of the epithelial cells of the gut. Okay, so that's the function of this domain. And then what's going to happen because of the other domain? It's going to form a pore. Okay, so what's a pore in the cell membrane? A hole. Okay, so it's going to form a hole in the membrane. And then what's going to happen to those cells? They'll explode, they'll lice. So it's going to essentially start dissolving um, the gut of the, of the insect. It literally like melts the wall of the gut. Okay, and then what's going to happen once, once the basal lamina is sort of like melted away in a region, now what's going to happen? The inside of the organism is going to start spilling out into the gut and the gut contents are going to start spilling into the organism, mixing into the hemolymph, and now more bacteria are mixing into the organism and the organism is just going to melt from the inside out and all these nutrients are going to mix together and allow more and more and more bacteria, Bacillus thuringiensis, to replicate. Okay, and as these things replicate, they're just going to literally eat the caterpillar from the inside out. And then eventually, once all those nutrients run out, the bacteria are going to hit the stationary phase and then they're going to start forming pores uh, or spores. And at about this point, they're going to start restockpiling cry proteins. So they'll make a bunch of cry proteins. And once they go into that spore form, in the spore, if you look at the spore, those crystals are stockpiled into the spores so that it's ready to restart the cycle as soon as it's eaten by the next caterpillar. Does that sort of make sense? Um, so that's how it kills the insect. So, okay, we got a little bit of time. Um, how can you, how do they, how do you guys, how, what are the forms in which they use Bt that you're aware of in agriculture? Bt, oh my god, this thing is like freaking out. <laughs> they spray it on the crops, right? Spray, when you say spray it, what are you saying they spray? The crystals. They spray the crystals. That is, you could do that. You could spray the crystals. But is that, is that actually the most common way that they do it? That, that'd be a really expensive way to do it. Isn't it a spore that's been mixed with almost like a water buffer? Yeah, they can spray the spores. So they can just culture the 
So when you go to like the store and you buy like a pile of like BT, you're actually buying like the spores, the, the bacterial, the bacterial spores. And you can spray those and then just spray those on your crops. And then if there's any herbivores, they'll eat those. And so this is actually considered organic. Why is this organic? Because it's found in nature and these things naturally produce these spores. Okay, what's the other way that you can use BT? You can make transgenic plants. You can make transgenic plants. And what would the transgenic plants be expressing? The proteins. The cry protein. The cry proteins. So many, many, many companies have made many, many, many different kinds of plants expressing these cry proteins. Okay. Uh, and we're going to talk more about that in the next lecture. This technique is considered GMO. Okay. Genetically modified organism. So one of the funny things is that the chemical that people are worried about is the same in the organic as in the GMO. It's the same chemical. It's the cry protein. That's the thing that's doing it. That's what everybody's concerned about. And it's funny that actually if you buy the spores, the spores are famous for like overdosing the plants much with much, much, much more than what's needed of the killing toxin. Okay. So the spores actually have a much higher content of the toxin than the transgenic plants. Okay. But those are considered organic. And that's considered like okay to do. Um, but a lot of people are upset that the transgenic plants are made to express these cry proteins, even though they're expressing it at a much, much lower rate. Okay. So that's that's one of sort of the interesting discussions where I think some of the science gets lost in a sense that I don't know if the people who are upset about the GMOs know that what they're spraying on their own organic crops is exactly the same, except they're spraying more of the toxin all over their organic plants, which is kind of funny. Um, okay, so one of the things I'll talk about with these BT cry proteins, which I think make them super interesting, is if these things float around in bacteria, okay, so if this is a BT organism, the cry proteins, where do you think you find the genes that code for the cry proteins? The cry genes, where do you find these? On the outside of the outside. Well, they're either going to be on the chromosome or they're going to be on... What? A plasmid. I remember I always say that you always find really interesting genes on plasmids. So BT has plasmids, and in the plasmids you find the cry proteins. Why would it want cry proteins on plasmids? So they can share it with the other. Yes. So one of the reasons it would want them on a plasmid is that they would be then mobile. Okay. So you could share them. Like if if one particular strain uh, share with friends. Um, if one particular strain had a really good functioning cry protein, you could then now share it. Okay, so if there was a, su a successful scenario where this thing got eaten by a giant insect, um, that, that plasmid could then be shared with a bunch of new friends in its new environment, and then you could reproduce that successful strategy. Um, why else would you want to have them on plasmids besides sharing? What's going to happen when you're sharing genetic information? You're going to lose them. Um, so they're going to be better. Yes, they're going to be adapting and evolving very, very quickly. Things on plasmids evolve very, very fast, and it's because they evolve with recombination. So there's going to be lots of recombinations because this this plasmid is is going to get pumped out and it's going to get pumped in back and forth between many different BT bacterial strains, and you're going to get scenarios where in one strain of BT there might be a couple different plasmids which all have a couple different like orthologs. So remember orthologs would be the same gene but from a different, I guess it would be from a different species. So maybe I should say homologs. This thing is going to be encountering different cry homologs. So if you look in the literature of cry literature, you see like cry 1a, cry 1b, cry 2c, 
cry three, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, X, Y, Z. You'll see this. And if you look in the patent literature for all these like Syngenta, Monsanto, they have like cry 2385 Z, which means like they've, they've studied like thousands of different homologs, different versions of these cry proteins. Um, and what I want to get back to is the reason you would want to have so many different variations of these toxins is because this is constantly a evolutionary battle between the insect gut receptor and the cry protein. So the insects that are getting killed by this are going to be evolving their gut receptors to change so that they no longer interact with the cry protein. And the cry proteins are going to be constantly trying to evolve so that they have a better interaction with the gut. So do you see how there's like an arms race there? Okay, so um, let me ask a question. Read, if a cry 1AC interacts with, say, a lepidopterin, which is like a caterpillar, is it going to interact with also with um, a dipterin, like a mosquito? Uh, what would be your guess? I mean, yes. Why would you say yes? What's what's your rationale? So I guess this is not extremely uneducated at this point. If it's reacting with that, why wouldn't it react with the other? That's a good question. Well, so let's answer that. So if it's reacting with a receptor from the lepidopterin, why would it react, or it would it react with a receptor? from a dipterin. In one sense, you're right in a sense of thinking like these are gonna be the same type of protein. They're gonna share a similarity. That makes sense. Um, but these proteins in different organisms are gonna be evolving fast, okay? And so it's unlikely in a sense that they're evolving fast, their amino acid sequence is changing. So it's unlikely that if the difference in evolution of this is like on the level of the order, like a, a lepidopterin is very, very, very far away from a dipterin, then it's unlikely that this ortholog is gonna work in this. So what you'll see in the literature is there's very, very special cry proteins for different pests. Okay, so you might see cry 1AC works well with um, corn earworm, which might be a lepidopterin. But if you, lepidopterin, I should slow down. But if you want to use BT to kill mosquitoes in a pond, you can't use that same cry protein. You gotta get a different cry protein that kills mosquitoes. And all that is gonna be conveyed by the interaction between the toxin receptor domain and the gut receptor of the particular insect. So the important point is whatever pest you're going to control, that BT toxin is only going to work for a certain pest. So when they make plants, they make they might make BT corn. That BT corn might only be good for one type of pest. Okay. Um, if they make BT cotton, the BT cotton, if it's being eaten by a different pest is going to be engineered with a different cry ortholog. Okay, so I just want you to know that there's many different cry orthologs, and the differences are going to be in this gut receptor domain. The pore domain probably shouldn't change because membranes are all going to be made of the same lipid bilayer, but this gut receptor domain is going to be changing a lot. Does that make sense? Any questions? Yes, and we'll talk about that more in the next lecture. So that would be multi, what do they call this, multi-trait or multi-locus stacking. That's when you take like cry 1AC, you'd express that transgenically in a plant and then you'd also give it like cry 1B and maybe these both can kill a certain pest. Why would you want to do this? Do you know? Oh, I was meaning if you wanted to kill like, like caterpillars again, like something else. Oh yeah, they will do like multi-trait um, 
stacking so that it has broad spectrum sort of control. But why else would you want to do this? As like a wider range control? Yeah. I get Well, not in a sense of wider range control, I guess. Uh, let me just say, okay, so the, one of the other reasons you would want to do this is this is harder to evolve resistance against, okay? Because if you evolve resistance against, so if you're an insect and your gut receptor changes so that it no longer interacts with this one, it still probably will interact with this one. So it's very, very hard to evolve resistance to two things at the same time. So this multi-trait multi stacking is much, much harder to evolve resistance to. But a lot of the corn now is two gene, two cry gene, resist, um, is two cry gene expressing. And there are bugs now that are evolving resistance to that. So now the three gene, now the three gene variants are being like released and being engineered. And they're also like mixing and matching. So you might take like a piece of this and mix it with a piece of that. And then you get like a chimeric. So you also see lots of like chimeric cry proteins. Any other questions? Otherwise, that's BT in a nutshell. Um, so business. Next lecture will be, so have a good spring break. Next lecture will be BT resistance, how BT resistance evolves. And then um, I'll either do one more lecture or a review before the test, which would be on Friday, the Friday of the week that you come back. Good? Definitely going to be that Friday. There's no possibility. I mean, if people ask for it to be postponed, I could like put it on the Monday, but nobody has asked then. What? Be it would be preferable? preferable. Okay, then we'll just do it on the Monday. That's fine. Thank you. Yep. Have a good spring break. Don't get coronavirus. <laughs> I'll try not to.